please tell us how you structured the data that you gathered and what these data imply. Uh, we're going to structure the data around these colors, uh, which reflect how data is depicted within the IRD program. So you'll see, we'll talk about uh, green bars. These green bars indicate these are the kids who are on grade level. They're doing great. Okay. We'll also talk about uh, red bars, and these red bars will indicate a uh, percentage of kids who are two or more grades below their chronological or current grade level. So these are kids who are pretty far behind and they're really struggling and they're going to need lots of additional supports to, to realize success and to track with grade level curriculum. Um, so this data is for reading and it's grades one through eight and just to orient you to it, please take a look at grade three. Okay, so what this says is in the gray bars, historically 65% of kids were reading at grade level at this point in time in the school year. Um, and this year is dropped to 59%. As you see that the, the drops of the percentage of kids on grade level um, is certainly more pronounced and most significant in grades one, two, and three, uh, critical grades uh, where we're starting by grade three to make the shift from learning to read to reading to learn. And we also, I think, all understand the criticality of grade three. Um, uh, you know, great organizations like NAEP would tell you lots of sobering statistics about the fact that you can't read at grade level by grade three, um, you're four times less likely to graduate from high school. Um, you'll also see in the older grades, uh, there are decreases about the percentage of kids who are on grade level, but they are certainly much, much smaller. Uh, but I do want to point out uh, that these decreases of grade level reading expectations and performance for all kids is present in all grades. Uh, now, the flip side of this, unfortunately, is that it's not just that kids are not at grade level. Some of them are very, very far from grade level, and that's depicted by the bars here in red. So if I were to take, for example, third grade, what this says is historically, 16% of the kids were multiple grades below their current grade level, um, and this year it's dropped to 22%. Okay. Now, if I want to understand to what degree these challenges have played out differently uh, for different kinds of populations, um, I can take a look at this data, and this is specifically for third grade reading. Um, if I take a look at this, what this indicates here is that for schools that serve majority Black populations, right, the percentage of kids that are on grade level dropped from 47% to 38%. And the percentage of kids who are multiple grades below their current grade level um, has gone from 27% to 38%. The comparable number for schools that serve majority Latino populations is, are 8% and 9%. And the comparable numbers for schools that serve majority white populations, 6% and 5%. So this tells you what I don't think anyone's surprised to hear, which is that the implications of the pandemic in terms of school disruptions have disproportionately impacted uh, students of color. I've thrown a lot of data at you really quickly. Uh, what, what's the sum of this? So uh, let's just take an illustration here. Just imagine um, this is a classroom um, populated um, in large part with kids of color, in large part lower income kids. And this is what the world looked like pre-pandemic, if you remember those, if you remember those times, right? In fall of 2019, I have but half my kids are in the yellow chairs, meaning they're a little behind and if they have a great year, they'll catch up. And I have about the same number of green chairs as red chairs, meaning about the same number of kids who are sort of doing great on grade level as the number of kids who are in red who are gonna need additional supports to realize success in the classroom. Okay, that's what it looked like. This is what I think is gonna look like in the fall of 2021, a, a, dis a different distribution of those chairs. And specifically, I'm saying we were going in this classroom, we went from seven kids on grade level to four. I think about, the red chairs, we went from seven kids that were multiple grades below grade level to 10. And, you know, two of those kids have really not participated in school consistently since the pandemic hit. So for the last year, you know, and three of those kids, imagine, will stay virtual. So as a teacher, I have to teach 25 kids in person, simultaneously three kids virtually. That's hard. And, you know, all kids will have social emotional needs. But imagine there's a handful that have experienced unique levels of trauma that the teacher may or may not be aware of day one of school. So what's what's the sum of all this? Why am I, why am I telling you this? So the sum of all this, the data, uh, this depiction here, um, is that, you know, I think we all understand that teaching is more important today than it ever has. Um, but I do want to point out the job is different. It is very different and it's much harder, right? You think of all those complexities, we just talked about that a result of that data, which are a result of what's going on with COVID and school disruptions. So we support prioritizing the needs of teachers as we think about all the new strategies that we want to employ to support students. Supporting, uh, we, we support prioritization of teacher time, teacher needs, and all forms of teacher recognition. Thank you. Thanks, Woody. Beth, what do the data imply about what teachers need to consider 
as they plan for their K-3rd classes this fall. Thank you so much for having me. As my colleagues have mentioned, data is crucial as we enter this next academic school year. Among the many ways in which schools are being transformed by the pandemic, changes in public school enrollment will likely have important consequences in elementary classrooms across the nation. Because the academic and non-academic skills students develop in their preschool and early elementary school years are foundational to important long-term outcomes, understanding these changes and finding ways to effectively support our youngest students is critical. Drawing on recent research, we offer four timely considerations. Districts across the country reported substantial drops in the number of students enrolled, especially in their kindergartens this past school year. This shift suggests a likely scenario of a kinder bubble in coming years as more and older students enter school. Additionally, districts may see larger split age classes for both first grade and kindergarten cohorts, and with many more students unfamiliar with in-person classroom routines. In sum, we need to prepare for greater age differences in kindergarten and in some first grade classrooms. Schools are also seeing sizable declines in preschool enrollment. If these missing students enroll next year, more students will enter formal schooling without typical pre-K preparation. Additionally, as my colleagues have discussed, the pandemic is likely widening inequalities and exacerbating opportunity gaps. Taken together, these trends suggest a wider skill disparity upon entry. Third, we can use summer strategically. Many systems are working to expand their instructional and enrichment programming this summer. Additionally, promising early kindergarten programs bring early childhood and school partners together to promote a successful transition for children and families in underserved communities. Such efforts help children build social skills, acquire the confidence, and become excited about classroom learning. Finally, the academic and non-academic data will play a crucial role in helping educators and families understand the ways to best meet the needs of young students. We also offer some classroom recommendations for educators including the importance of fostering a sense of belonging and purpose. Elementary teachers are so good at this. Kindergarten teachers in particular play a pivotal role in cultivating students' love of learning. And it all starts with relationships. Taking the time to engage students in getting to know their teacher and their classmates while making space to build learning community is essential in the first few weeks. Second, whole group instruction can be challenging to design when there are a variety of learning needs among students. When you want to provide opportunities to address students' various needs, consider creating small, flexible groups of students. We also stress the need to explicitly teach, model, practice, and monitor classroom routines. This provides students with a predictable and organized learning environment, one in which they feel secure and empowered to self-manage. Finally, I think it's important to acknowledge the heroic efforts educators have made this past year. Teachers have found powerful ways to connect to their students, whether virtually or in person. And those relationships are more critical now than ever as we work to collectively support our youngest students. Thank you for having me. Hetty, the pandemic is causing greater rates of absenteeism. Tell us what we have to be aware of for this next school year. Thanks so much for having me here for this really critical conversation. Enrollment hesitancy among families is likely to result in some students, especially from communities hard hit by the pandemic, delaying participation in in-person classrooms. And even more concerning, schools are likely to experience higher levels of chronic absence in the early grades than ever before. Even in a normal school year, it takes a while for families with young students to get used to a new environment, establish a regular routine of showing up to school, and put in place transportation and backup supports so kids can get to class even when families face challenges. And it will be even harder this year when so many students have been out of the routine of in-person school for some as many as 18 months. Prior to the pandemic, one out of 10 kindergartners and first graders were chronically absent nationwide. And in low-income communities, this could be double or triple that level. This data from Connecticut offers a picture of what we may see. Chronic absence are almost double. Kindergartners have the highest levels of chronic absence, but what's concerning is those chronic absence levels stay elevated in the remaining elementary grades. Left unaddressed, high rates of chronic absence predict adverse consequences for learning. Chronically absent kindergartners are less likely to read on grade level by third grade, more likely to continue to be chronically absent, more likely to be retained. The gaps grow over time. 
and students living in poverty suffer the most. They're more likely to experience systemic attendance barriers that are harder to resolve and can last multiple years. And they're less likely to have the resources at home to make up for the lost learning time in the classroom. But the impact isn't just on the individual students who are chronically absent, it's also on their peers whose math and reading scores can also be affected. Chronic absence is a leading indicator and a cause of educational inequity. And all of this has implications for how schools and communities can support our youngest students and their families in the coming year. It means that we're gonna to need to enhance our attention to school climate. We'll need to monitor attendance and chronic absence data so we can better allocate resources for early outreach and intervention and engage in continuous improvement. If kids aren't there, maybe what we're offering isn't working. We're gonna to have to support positive problem solving, not punitive action. And it's gonna make it even more essential that we establish authentic partnerships between teachers, parents, and caregivers. Those who are quote, the learning guardians for our kids. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the chance to be here.